just in. You were looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers there was of the World Trade impact. Center. With CNN Center right, right now is just right beginning. Right. Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. Right. Oh my God. Another plane. Right now, you got people running up the street. It would appear that there are people jumping out the windows. Oh, they're they jumping out the windows. I can't see the final example here. The police officers at the IA. And you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. Another plane has crashed this one about 80 miles south of Pittsburgh. The second building that was hit by the plane has just completely collapsed. The entire building has just collapsed. It's pulled it down on itself and it's not there anymore. It's not there anymore. Just landing uh, only a few minutes ago at Andrews Air Force Base. Returning to the White House, getting ready to address the nation around 9 p.m. Whatever is imagined was going to occur on his watch was to test his leadership qualities. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. Thank you, good night, and God bless America. My name is Laurie Van Auken. My husband, Kenneth Van Auken, was killed on September 11th um, at the World Trade Center. He was on the 105th floor of the North Tower, which was the first building that was hit and the second building to collapse. My name is Patricia Casaza. I lost my husband, John Casaza. He worked for Cantor Fitzgerald on the 104th floor of the first tower. My name is Mindy Kleinberg, and I lost my husband, Alan. He worked for Cantor Fitzgerald on the 104th floor of the North Tower. I got a message from him on the morning of September 11th um, saying that, I love you, I'm in the World Trade Center, the building was hit by something, I don't know if I'm going to get out, um, but I love you very much and I hope I see you later, bye. And uh, I didn't make it to the phone on time to speak with him. I tried calling him back, um, and I was never able to reach him, so I never spoke to him again. I was actually doing laundry uh, when I got a call from my husband. And uh, he had thought that a bomb had gone off in his building. And when, by the time he had called me, he had checked all those avenues and uh, said that, uh, you know, the floor is already filling up with a thick black smoke, and uh, I don't think we're going to make it. Um, he said, you know, I love you. Tell, my, tell John that I love him, our son. On September 11, 2001, 2,972 people from more than 80 countries were killed, leaving thousands of loved ones behind. While grieving continued for many, some began to move beyond their personal pain. My, my husband's service was in October, and uh, then I, I think I went into angry mode, and that's when I started to question everything. I spent a lot of time on the computer. I started reading every single article that I could get my hands on. I mean, there was no sleeping at the beginning because 
we were grieving, it was hard to lay down. So I would spend all night just researching. I want to meet with the NSA, CIA, and the FBI together oh. in one room. Out of the many who were researching on their own, four widowed mothers found each other. New Jersey residents Mindy Kleinberg, Patty Casaza, Lori Van Auken, along with Kristen Breitweiser, became known as the Jersey Girls. We became friends and like-minded. We all had questions. We all had questions and we wanted answers. At the top of the family's growing list of questions, why had the U.S. military defenses failed to stop any of the four hijacked planes? The FAA alerted U.S. air defense units of a possible hijacking at 8.38 Tuesday morning. The last plane was reported to have crashed in Pennsylvania just after 10 a.m. That's almost two hours, <laughs> you know, where planes were flying around the skies of the United States with no military response. Coming across an article in a Canadian paper, the Jersey widows learned it had been a routine for NORAD, the military apparatus in charge of air defense, to scramble fighters to intercept planes during suspected emergencies. Fatal accident involving a Learjet flying The women recalled country, one such incident no one that was heavily control. reported the in 1999. Just 25 minutes into the flight, controllers lost radio contact with the pilot, and an Air Force F-16 on a training mission was sent to take a look. Ultimately, six military jets gave chase. The plane was tracked by the FAA on radar. At high levels, the military, even the White House, discussed what to do. Tell me what the difference was between those times and the day of September 11th. They wondered about the lack of immediate response by the president and his Secret Service detail. President Bush was in a Florida elementary school classroom that morning, where he sat for more than seven minutes after being informed of the second attack. The Secret Service has an arrangement with the FAA. They op had open lines after the uh, World Trade Center. Tracking it by radar. And uh, under these circumstances, they just move. They don't say, sir, or uh, uh, ask politely. They uh, came in and said, sir, we have to leave immediately. And grabbed me and... and, uh, and Literally moved. grabbed you and moved you? Yeah. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. If people fell down on the jobs by not informing those who were in leadership positions who had the power to do something, why were we not looking at what our protocols were there so that we could fix it going forward? Our families didn't want us asking these questions. That was painful. We should, you know, just be grieving and healing. Well, part of our healing process is finding out exactly what happened. We really were looking for answers um, feverishly at the beginning, and there was very little um, information being put out through the major media um, that answered our questions. There were just more questions. Every time we would look into something, we'd have more questions. One article led to a question that begat another question that begat another question. And when you couldn't thread them together and you couldn't come to an answer that made sense, you know, we started to catalog our, our questions. The families raised questions about the track record of the FBI and the elusive search for justice after 9-11. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. Throughout the week after the attack, there were numerous accounts that the hijackers had a large number of accomplices in the United States. 75 individuals who are currently detained, over 480 people arrested, nearly 1,000 individuals. The families waited for the 9-11 trials to begin, but they never came. After the public spectacle of roundups, the Justice Department quietly let the suspects go one by one. A year later, the families would learn that only six of the original detainees were still in custody, and none had been charged with any terrorist act. The FBI continuously was changing agents who were on the investigation. I mean, when you're trying to connect the dots, you need continuity. Journalist Gail Sheehy spent months with the four widows. I mean, they wanted 
to find that more was done and was going to be done, but they kept finding that less was being done. We uh, printed articles, copied them. By November, it had become the sense among most 9-11 families that an independent investigation would be necessary to do what the Justice Department and the news media seemed unwilling to do. We felt that the country was at risk from terrorists and from incompetence, and um, maybe worse. They get a little outside Washington, they stop a red light, and they begin wriggling out of their debris pants and putting on their nice little skirts and suits so they could go around all the offices of Congress, bedevil these members of Congress and say, what are you doing about this? Soon, a 9-11 commission bill was being sponsored in Congress. Senator Tom Daschle said last week that you called him several times and urged him not to investigate the events of September 11th. Well, Tom's wrong. He has, a, I think, in this case, a, well, let's say a misinterpretation. He said on one occasion that the president asked him to do that at a breakfast meeting. He, are you now saying that they weren't asking to block an investigation? Lori was an independent. Mindy was definitely a Democrat. Actually, Kristen and myself voted for President Bush in the first election. And yet, even though he should have been our biggest advocate, he turned into one of our biggest adversaries. We still don't know what happened in those buildings. The Jersey widows were not the only ones seeking answers and becoming frustrated. In New York, Sally Regenhard, who had lost her firefighter son Christian in the building's collapse, was forming the skyscraper safety campaign. The 911 um, emergency tapes and recordings, plus 500 interviews done with the fire department right after 9-11. All that material has been withheld from the public. Sally partnered with widow Monica Gabrielle, who lost her husband Richard at the World Trade Center. Why did the buildings fall? How could, how could skyscrapers just like crumble to the ground in 10 seconds? Never before or since had fire caused a steel frame building to collapse. World Trade Center Building Number 7, never hit by an airplane, also collapsed that evening. Building 7, ablaze at the moment and apparently getting ready to collapse. The largest structural collapse in world history, the largest loss of life on American soil since the Civil War, and not one governmental or elected official wanted to know why and how this happened. Realizing strength in numbers, 9-11 families rallied at the Capitol to press for answers. We need a full independent investigation. We must ask the tough questions and seek out the difficult answers. We must as a country grow and be made stronger and safer by the bitter lessons learned on September 11th. We are asking you, America, to stand behind us. Please. I was terrified to talk in front of anybody. This is not something that any one of us had ever done before. The rally united once isolated families. Bob McElvain, who lost his son Bobby, came from Philadelphia to join the group. Being down in Philly, it's like you're out of the loop. I was floundering by myself, just talking to people, trying to find anyone. That was um, the first time we all got together in, uh, in, in a new direction to push for the commission. Sharing many of the same questions and concerns, a coalition of family members began to take form. Its goal, a formal investigation. Call your congressman. Tell them that you want to be safe. An investigation must not interfere with the ongoing efforts to prevent the next attack. Frustrated with the attitude of the White House and seeming lack of interest from the public, the family members began actively seeking support from the news media. 
And given the persistence of the media's focus on pain and suffering, it was not difficult for the Jersey widows to get their attention. You know, it was my private pain and my private story, and I really did not want to share that. But we made a conscious decision that we would start to say to them, okay, well, I will tell you about me personally if you talk about the fact that there's not an investigation. Well, I'm joined right now by four women who lost their husbands in the attacks. Kristen Breitweiser is one of four New Jersey widows who lost... These women banded together after their husbands were killed, and now they're leading a campaign to find out exactly how did 9-11 happen. And finally, the media began to report on our activities um, not just the activities of the administration. Looking forward to the president and the vice president going to both come in there. To, to go on any show is not easy, so but you needed the public pressure in order to make anything happen in Washington. I mean, they need huge public pressure to move them. President Bush signed legislation today creating an independent commission to investigate the September 11th attack on America. President Buckling under pressure, the White House was finally agreeing to a deal. But in a stunning series of revelations, it soon appeared that the White House was stacking the odds against an investigation it had not wanted in the first place. The president named a supporter, Dr. Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State in the Nixon and Ford administrations, to head the panel. He has a penchant for secrecy, which is not what's needed here. There are questions about his role in Vietnam, his role in the coup in uh, Chile. Several family members approached Kissinger and requested a meeting at his office in New York. Prior to the meeting, Kristen Breitweiser conducted a thorough investigation of Kissinger's potential conflicts of interest. Probably much to the chagrin of some of the people in the room, Lori asked some very pointed questions. Would you have any Saudi American clients that you would like to tell us about? and he was very uncomfortable, kind of twisting and turning on the couch. And then she asked whether he had any clients by the name of bin Laden. And he just about <laughs> fell off his couch. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger stepped down from the position Friday. We thought the meeting went well. I wouldn't want to be in the way of some of these families. I mean, they're... <laughs> Kissinger was soon replaced by Tom Keene, a former New Jersey governor and former Congressman Lee Hamilton, who had chaired the House Intelligence Committee. The remaining eight commissioners were all former D.C. insiders and lawyers, evenly split between Republicans and Democrats. Remember in the 90s, they spent $100 million investigating Clinton's sexual exploits. $100 million. And they first allocated only $3 million to investigate the murder of 3,000 people. The budget was eventually raised to 14 million, but the investigation was also given less time than they had wanted, a year and a half. To monitor the commission, leading victim relatives established the Family Steering Committee. The group provided the commissioners with hundreds of well-researched questions for which they expected answers. The official start of our first public hearing of what is going to be a extraordinarily difficult and important job. In we March of 2003, 441 days after the attacks, the official investigation began in New York. Mindy Kleinberg from September 11th Advocates. On the morning of September 11th, my three-year-old son Sam and I walked Jacob 10 and Lauren 7 to the bus stop at about 8.40 a.m. Brad was 24 years old and the oldest of our three sons. Family steering committee Jacob members were among the first to testify before the commission. Hey mom, it's Brad. Uh, just wanted to call and let you know. I'm sure that you heard, there were, or maybe you haven't heard, but a plane crashed into World Trade Center 1. Um, we're fine, we're in World Trade Center 2. I'm uh, obviously alive and well over here, but uh, obviously a pretty scary experience. I saw a guy fall out of probably the 91st story uh, all the way down. So, <clears throat> you're welcome to give a call here. I think uh, we'll be here all day. I'm not sure if, uh, if the firm's gonna shut down for the day or what, but uh, 
give me a call back. Let him. I called Dad to let him know. Love you. Welcome, Mayor Michael Bloomberg of the City of New York. From the outset, many families were concerned by how the investigation was being conducted. We begged and pleaded that people should be put under oath. At the beginning, they were not. We'll describe our city government. As the hearings progressed, the families were becoming more and more frustrated by what they perceived as softball questioning from the commissioners. I've appreciated already his remarks. You know, we have certain questions that we, the families, wrote for each of the people that were coming to testify today. And the questions weren't asked. Complete waste of time. It was a, a bunch of people throwing accolades at each other and asking the same questions one after the other. Skirting around issues, not being uh, defined enough in their questions. It's a stonewall. It's a cover-up. As far as I'm concerned, I'm very bitter. I'm very angry. Still, no one was prepared for what they then uncovered about Philip Zelikow, the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. He who had the power to say where the investigation was going, who would be interviewed, what would go into the 9-11 Commission report, what wouldn't. We have found out that he not only served on the tr transition team of the uh, Bush administration, that he was a person who wrote a draft memo for the setup of the Bush administration's National Security Council, that he was an individual who wrote the preemptive war strategy that was eventually used for the war in Iraq, that he is a close friend of Condoleezza Rice's. We want him to resign. Philip Zelikow refused to resign, and Chairman Keene dismissed the family's concerns over conflicts of interest. Nearly a year in, the Commission had only received a small amount of the documents that they had requested. At this point, what we have is uh, uh, literally hundreds of boxes of materials that have come into the Commission, and we have not sorted through that. They gave them boxes and boxes of documents, but not left pertinent documents out. A deal announced yesterday between the White House and the Commission investigating the September 11th attacks is proving to be rather controversial. Under the agreement, only certain members of the Commission will be allowed to review classified documents from the White House, and their notes will be subject to administration review. I mean, I'm a member of the Commission. The President has said only a minority of the Commission can see a minority of the documents, and then they have to clear what they're going to say to the rest of the commission with the White House. The only two commission members allowed direct access to the documents? Jamie Gorlick, the deputy attorney general under President Clinton, and Philip Zelikow. I felt that the fix was in at that point in time. The majority of the commission felt that it was better to see uh, these documents uh, rather than take a chance in not seeing them at all. It's a scam. It's absolutely disgusting. This is important. We cannot do our responsibilities if we don't have all of us access to all the documents we need, including what's in the White House. And with the investigation nearing its deadline, the president, vice president, and national security advisor were still refusing to testify publicly. Yet few Americans were aware of the family's plight. Up till then, the hearings had received only minimal coverage. Suddenly, that all changed. In testimony before the 9-11 Commission later this week, and in a new book to be published tomorrow against all enemies, Clark will tell the story of what happened behind the scenes at the White House before, during, and after September 11th. To the loved ones of the victims of 9-11, your government failed you. Those entrusted with protecting you failed you, and I failed you. Mr. Clark is the first person that has apologized to the families. Clark's testimony provided the families with the timely leverage they needed to increase public pressure on reluctant White House witnesses. The Bush administration will allow National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice to testify publicly before the 9-11 Commission. For President Bush, it was a dramatic reversal. I've ordered this level of cooperation because I consider it necessary to gaining a complete picture of the months. And even years. the president and vice president Received agreed to meet with the commission, but with a catch. They insisted on meeting together behind closed doors and not under oath. 
President. Why are you and the Vice President insisting on appearing together before the 9-11 Commission? Because the 9-11 Commission, Commission wants to ask us questions. That's why we're meeting, and I look forward to meeting with them and answering their questions. Uh, why you're appearing together rather than separately, which was their request? Because it's a good chance for both of us to answer questions that the 9-11 Commission is uh, looking forward to asking us, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Let's see. We have to have one story, so I'll say a part, and if I get it wrong, hedge a little bit and give me the next. I want to thank the chairman and vice chairman for giving us a chance to share views on, a, on, on, on different subjects. And they had a lot of good questions, and I was, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I took the time. What topic did the commissioners want to spend most of the time on? Uh, I, I really, I, probably best that I not go into the details of the conversation. The president and vice president of the United States, don't you think they should be able to stand up and, and, and speak their own words? They should go under oath. They should be, yeah. In public. Don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what <laughs> you Adam, said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. For an I got the today. same answer, yeah. In July 2004, the commission published its final report the result in part of the family's two and a half year struggle for answers. Two and a half million pages of documents. We've interviewed over 1,200 individuals, including experts and officials past and present. And you've produced a, a truly bipartisan uh, uh, report that honors uh, the thousands who died on 9-11, honors their grieving family members. Thank you for creating a report that may be one of the most important uh, publications of our age. The commission members have worked hard and served our country well. I speak for all Americans in thanking them for their fine work. We, you know, waited for the report to come out and were hopeful, I was always hopeful that we would get a report that answered my questions. However, the commission report failed to meet many of the family's expectations and concluded that 9-11 was merely a failure of imagination. The percentage of the questions that got answered was very, very low. I'd say maybe 30% got touched upon, 70% didn't. The stuff that's included is the stuff that they really didn't have too much choice in including because they knew what we knew. You can do an investigation and if you don't really want to research an area, you just don't look at it. If you don't ask them all the questions or you don't let them tell you the whole story, you know, then you could write a report based on half truth. Are, they, are the people who lost loved ones at 9-11 like the families of guys who were lost in Vietnam? They just can't get over it. Sometimes people no, try to are... become crusaders because they, they can't deal with reality. The families, I think, have to understand that it, it's, it's virtually impossible to conceive of any way in which these attacks could have been stopped, even had the best things happened. On 9-11, the media started out by doing its job and somehow got waylaid. Um, and stopped doing its job. It began reporting solely on the administration and the government's um, activities. The news media, while yielding a fact here, a fact there, failed again and again to connect the dots. The one thing that I personally was, was hoping for was another Woodward and Bernstein with regard to 9-11. Um, someone, anyone that was willing to put their teeth into this. The families discovered a website created by independent investigator Paul Thompson. His complete 9-11 timeline, an innovative internet research tool, stitches together information from over 7,000 mainstream news stories. It was all our binders, okay, but laid out beautifully online and he had the ability to connect the dots. He would put a time up there and then he would back it up with mainstream media sources so you could understand why there were discrepancies in the timeline. Flight 93 crashed at 10.03 but the seismic data says 10.06 and then he'd have a link so you could see the seismic data. The whole mystique of intelligence is that you acquire this uh, very valuable information covertly. If the truth be told, about 80% 
of any uh, of what the information that one needs is available in open source materials. Thompson's work soon gained mainstream media exposure. Paul Thompson's timeline is based on public documentation of what we know, what the world knows about 9-11. James Ridgway was among the first to bring attention to Paul Thompson's timeline. You know, it has to be almost taken more seriously than, than the 9-11 Commission because, I mean, it's open. There's nothing secret here. As I began researching, I noticed this curious phenomenon, which is that there's a lot of explosive information that has come out in the mainstream press, but it comes out buried. As a casual observer of the news, I'd never noticed any of this stuff. You might find one important bit of information in, say, a newspaper story, and another bit of information on a news show. And if you start to put all those rather obscure stories together, you end up with an almost completely different narrative. For just about any area relating to 9-11, uh, the story is quite different if you dig deeper into the news. And clearly, uh, Something yesterday took place in New York that was not foreseen, that we had no specific, infor specific information about. Like most uh, Americans, Thompson was... initially didn't question the Bush administration's first statements about the attacks. The, press, the administration way. consistently maintained the, uh, that there were no warnings or specific no threats. Specific threat. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving... Uh, what happened, obviously, uh, the city's uh, airliner and so forth. There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of that would indicate this type of operation in the country. I first became interested in 9-11 around mid-2002, right around the time that uh, President Bush's now famous August 6th PDB became leaked to the press. President Bush was told in August that Osama bin Laden might be planning an attack involving the hijacking of U.S. aircraft. Dan, it was a revelation that the White House had no intention of making public. An official spent the entire day in full damage control. I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. His interest peaked. Thompson began to search for news stories that might help him determine exactly how aware the White House had been of Al-Qaeda's desire to use planes as weapons. He was quickly able to compile a wealth of examples that any journalist should have been able to find. One of the earliest dates back to 1995. It was codenamed Operation Bojinka, a terrorist plot to use commercial planes to attack U.S. targets. Ramzi Youssef, the bomb maker responsible for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, had fled the Philippines, where police discovered his bomb factory. Youssef again escaped, but his accomplice was arrested and spilled the chilling plot. Operation Bujinka, a plan to blow up multiple airliners over the Pacific, was heavily reported. But Thompson noted most journalists failed to mention the second aspect of the plot. Only CNN International dug deeper into this story. In confidential documents from the Philippines obtained by CNN, the plan was clear. He will board any American commercial aircraft, control its cockpit, and dive it at the CIA headquarters. Other buildings targeted the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. And the FBI, using the Philippine documents, did check the four flight schools named there, but found no evidence of any other planned terror attacks. Only NBC reported a stunning confession by a man allegedly trained by bin Laden. It was over a year before 9-11, a Pakistani British man told the FBI an incredible tale that he'd been trained by followers of Osama bin Laden to hijack airplanes, and he confessed he was now in America to carry out an attack. Khan was recruited into Al-Qaeda at a British mosque, then flown to Lahore, Pakistan for hijack training in a Mach 767 cockpit before being sent to America, where he was told he would hijack a plane from JFK and fly it into a building. I told him before the 
about more than a year be hijacking an American or uh, an America airline. Khan claims he got cold feet. Instead of meeting his contact, he slipped away, gambled away all his money, and in fear turned himself in and confessed. I've been to Pakistan. I know about this hijacking, something going on. NBC News has learned Khan passed not one, but two polygraphs. A former FBI official says Newark agents believed him, but word came from headquarters, quote, return him to London and forget about it. Access to this exclusive footage from NBC is now restricted. July 2001, according to 60 Minutes, Egyptian intelligence received a report that 20 Al-Qaeda had slipped into the U.S. and four of them had trained on Cessnas. Now, to the Egyptians, pilots of small planes didn't sound terribly alarming. But they passed on the message to the CIA anyway, fully expecting Washington to request more information. The request never came. In fact, Thompson compiled stories about 14 different nations that had warned the U.S. prior to 9-11. You could have one story that comes out on the front page and another story that comes out on page B-12. And what I found is that many times, the story that comes out on B-12 is more important than the story that comes out on the front page. March, Italian intelligence gave information to the U.S. based on their wiretap of an Al-Qaeda cell in Milan. The LA Times and the Washington Post said the wiretaps warned of brothers going to the United States and a massive strike involving aircraft. August. According to Moroccan and French newspapers, an intelligence agent reported that bin Laden's men were preparing large-scale operations in New York in the summer or fall of 2001. The agent was then called to the U.S. to report this information directly. August. Britain warned three times of an Al-Qaeda attack in the U.S., the final warning specifying multiple airplane hijackings. According to Britain's Sunday Herald, the warning was passed on to President Bush a short time later. It's unknown how many of these warnings, reported but buried in back pages, reached the White House through official channels. But one threat assessment is well known to have reached President Bush directly. It was known as the Presidential Daily Briefing, or PDB, of August 6th. The Bush administration kept it from the public for months until it was revealed in part by the CBS News in May 2002, putting the White House on the defensive. All of this reporting about hijacking was about traditional hijacking. You take a plane, people were worried they might blow, some, blow one up. On the, uh, I'd like to ask you about the uh, August 6th uh, PDB. Sure. You mentioned it. Uh, Two years later, President Bush responded to questions about what led him to request the August 6th briefing. Yeah. Um, and I asked for the briefing. And the reason I did is because there had been a lot of threat um, uh, intelligence from overseas. And so I, and the, part of it had to do with the Genoa G8 conference that I was going to attend. Eight of the world's most powerful leaders gathered here to discuss global problems. And yet the threat of violence means they're having to keep the world at bay. Just prior to the G8 summit, CNN.com reported the head of Russia's Federal Bodyguard Service has warned of a plot by terrorist Osama bin Laden to assassinate George W. Bush. The LA Times reported U.S. officials were warned of a threat posed from the air by commercial airliners. It's terrorists as well as protesters the Italian government fears, so anti-aircraft batteries were on standby at the airport. Condoleezza Rice was present there, President Bush, Ari Fleischer, Karl Rove, President Bush's own family. They were going to sleep on a boat so that a plane couldn't go into a building. This floating resort will be home for three days for the G8 leaders, necessary for their safety. If the August 6 PDB was prompted by a threat from the air in Genoa, clearly President Bush his spokesperson, Ari Fleischer, and his national security advisor, Condi Rice, were more than aware of the threat of planes as weapons, but the news media appeared to miss the lead. 
We have information about simultaneous hijackings. No specific threat. Planes being used as weapons. I don't think anybody could have predicted. Specific targets, including mentions of Pentagon, World Trade Center. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Dr. Rice, would you please rise and raise your right hand? You swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In April 2004, public pressure finally forced the White House to allow Dr. Rice to testify before the 9-11 Commission to answer questions about the PDB and the nature of warnings given the administration. The threat reporting that we received in the spring and summer of 2001 was not specific as to time, nor place, nor manner of attack. Almost all of the reports focused on al-Qaeda activities outside the United States. This sat in stark contrast to the warnings well documented in Thompson's timeline. What the August 6th PDB said, and perhaps I should uh, read it to you. We would be happy to have it declassified in full. When she was testifying, one Ben Venice was really trying to get into the nitty gritty. Did you tell the president at any time prior to August 6th of the existence of al-Qaeda cells in the United States? Um, first, let me just make certain... If you could just answer that well, question, first, because I only have a very I, limited... I understand, Commissioner, but it's, Did important, you tell it's the important, president. important that I also address... It wasn't like a trial. You couldn't grill these people till you got the answer. I really don't remember, um, Commissioner, whether I discussed this with the president. Just let me well, move on if th I There may. were no specifics. And what about August 6th? What did August 6th memo say? And then she would start going off. It was historical information based on uh, old reporting. There was no new threat information, and it did not, in fact, warn of any coming attacks inside the United States. And what was the title of the memo? I believe the title was Bin Laden Determined to Attack Inside the United States. Uh, uh, now, the, uh, the PDB... You. Two weeks later, the White House finally declassified the PDB. There's lots of examples where it's a domestic threat. Bin Laden told followers he wanted to retaliate in Washington. You know, Bin Laden was planning to exploit the operative's access to, U to the U.S. to mount a terrorist strike. Abu Zubaydah was planning his own U.S. attack. Less FBI information since that time indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks, including recent surveillance of federal buildings in New York. That's present tense and domestic. Ari Fleischer came out right after September 11th and said, there were no warnings. I watched him tell me there were no warnings, okay? I want to know why nobody has gone back and said, what did he mean? Howard Dean recently seemed to muse aloud whether you had advanced knowledge of 9-11. Yeah, uh, look, there's time for politics. And, uh, you know, it's time for politics and, uh, I, uh, it's an absurd insinuation. The press has reported this one, and that one, but they haven't really put it all together and said, God, how many different warnings did you get? How many different ways was this information coming at you? And why wasn't anything done about all these warnings? Why is the Attorney General of the United States doing all his air travel by specially chartered jet? The Justice Department cited what it called a threat assessment by the FBI and said Ashcroft has been advised to travel only by private jet for the remainder of his term. And on the night before the attacks, the President may have slept more soundly, knowing surface-to-air missiles were placed on the roof of the Sarasota, Florida resort where he was staying. Not a typical security procedure at the time. That same night, quote, 
a particularly urgent warning may have been received, causing some top Pentagon brass to cancel their scheduled flights the morning of 9-11. Why that same information was not available to the 266 people who died aboard the four hijacked aircraft may become a hot topic on the Hill. It never did. We took an oath not to talk about during the campaign, I think correctly so, to increase the capacity of that commission's report to be heard by the People's Congress. Now it's beyond the campaign, so the promise I had to keep this out of the campaign is over. So Mr. President, you knew they were in the United States. You were warned by the CIA. You knew in July they were inside the United States. You were told again by briefing officers in August that it was a, that it was a dire threat. Didn't do anything to harden our border security. Didn't do anything to harden airport security. Didn't do anything to engage local law enforcement. Didn't do anything to round up INS and consular offices and say we have to shut this down. And didn't warn the American people. What did you do? Nothing, so far as we could see. The government first said there were no warnings. There were. Then the White House insisted the warnings were not specific as to where, when, or how. The 9-11 families and the timeline connected the dots where the media didn't. There were many warnings. Most were detailed, some were urgent, and yet little or no defensive action was taken by responsible officials, except for their own personal protection. The public was better informed in the summer of 2001. Lives would have been saved. Maybe the attacks wouldn't have been prevented. Lives would have been saved. My husband was in Tower 2. If he knew that it was a terrorist attack, he wouldn't have stayed in the building. When they were told that the building was secure and to stay at their desk, maybe they would have left. Maybe, you know, those who thought that the first attack was an errant plane would have thought differently and responded differently. But again, we weren't given the information to make any of these decision, decisions for ourselves. Even as the first tower burned on every channel that morning, no one on the federal level who had received warnings all summer called New York to order an evacuation of Tower 2. No one ordered fighters to perform any timely defensive action against the remaining hijacked planes no one responded adequately to the crisis. It has been said that the intelligence agencies have to be right 100% of the time, and the terrorists only have to get lucky once. This explanation for the devastating attacks of September 11, simple on its face, is wrong in its value. Because the 9-11 terrorists were not just lucky once. They were lucky over and over again. When you have this repeated pattern of broken protocols, broken laws, broken communication, one cannot still call it luck. If at some point we don't look to hold the individuals accountable for not doing their jobs properly, then how can we ever expect for terrorists to not get lucky again? Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. On September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country. And tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. The Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists or they will share in their fate. We have a live picture that we're showing from Kabul. American ground forces at this hour are penetrating Afghanistan. Mazari Sharif apparently has been taken. We had reached to the outskirts of Kabul. One of Osama bin Laden's top lieutenants was killed. One of the infamous Al Qaeda caves. Plenty of room for some fighters to hide when the American bombs start to fall. 
from broken military activity attacking the White Mountains. Despite the crushing defeat of Al-Qaeda forces at Tora Bora, U.S. military officials still don't know where to find Osama bin Laden. This is Tora Bora, the remains. The rest of the Afghan fighters are headed home. The caves of Tora Bora conquered, a terrorist shelter, now just a hole in the ground. The, the distinguished interim leader of a liberated Afghanistan, Chairman Hamid Karzai. America's apparently clear military victory in Afghanistan was not so clear cut to Paul Thompson. The war ended very quickly, but in the end, the U.S. was only able to capture or kill one major al-Qaeda figure and no Taliban figures. You know, the fact is right now today, we don't have any high-ranking Taliban or al-Qaeda, but we haven't really captured anybody, one or two on the fringe. His understanding of the government's actions before 9-11 now fundamentally changed. Thompson decided to take a similar look into what happened in Afghanistan. The press never looked very closely at how so many of these leaders were able to escape. However, if you piece together a number of different news accounts, you can begin to understand the story. Early November, the London Times reported bin Laden's closest advisors all escaped in a late night convoy from the Afghan capital of Kabul. An eyewitness reported, we don't understand how they weren't all killed the night before, because they came in a convoy of at least a thousand cars and trucks. It must have been easy for American pilots to see the headlights. By the 10th, bin Laden had joined the convoy in Jalalabad. An intelligence official told Knight Ritter newspapers it was obvious that this area was to be the base for an exodus to Pakistan. We were amazed that nothing was done to prepare for it. On November 14th, the Northern Alliance captured Jalalabad. That night, 1,000 fighters and a convoy of several hundred vehicles escaped again, this time with bin Laden, driving hours to the fortress in Tora Bora. The U.S. bombed the nearby Jalalabad airport, but apparently did not attack the convoy. November 15th, at the cave complexes of Tora Bora, an estimated 1,600 of bin Laden's fighters are now surrounded. The most important battle of the war begins. U.S. warplanes are keeping a close eye on mountain passes. U.S. Special Forces are working with Pakistani troops on the border to block possible escape routes. While there were two main escape routes, Newsweek reported that the U.S. bombed only one. Using the other route, hundreds of Al-Qaeda and Taliban, including senior leaders, escaped. In the wake of the attacks, eyewitnesses told Britain's The Daily Telegraph that they were shocked that the U.S. had surrounded Tora Bora only on three sides. Bin Laden walked out of the Tora Bora cave complex and into Pakistan with a number of loyal followers. Of course we're after Saddam Hussein, I mean, uh, Bin Laden. He's, 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 he's isolated. In August 2005, a story broke that gave Paul Thompson a missing piece of the puzzle. In an exclusive interview with Newsweek, the CIA field commander in Tora Bora during the invasion, Gary Bernson, broke his silence. He explained that his intelligence operatives had tracked bin Laden to Tora Bora. Mr. Bernstein feels so strongly about getting this story out uh, and getting his book published that he actually resigned two years short of retirement uh, from the CIA in order to publish his book. At the time of this interview, he was required to speak through his attorney until the CIA cleared his book for publication. At various points in time, they did have, to my understanding, definitive intelligence as to his general location within Tora Bora. I can't go into detail as to the actual uh, sources of the intelligence and the collection methods because those remain classified. However, we had Osama bin Laden essentially cornered in Tora Bora, and for whatever reasons, we did not do what was necessary uh, in order to ensure that he did not escape. The goal has never been to, to get bin Laden. Obviously, that's desirable. Uh, 
it's interesting. I just read a piece by some analysts that said uh, you may not want to go after the top people in these organizations. You may have more effect by going after the middle managers because they're harder to replace. Toward the end of the war, when all eyes were on Tora Bora, the news media missed another major story. Again, thousands of Taliban and Al-Qaeda escaped without drawing U.S. fire, this time from the northern city of Kunduz. The Taliban's only stronghold in the region has all but fallen to the forces of the Northern Alliance. Once again, the door was left open for escape. Our side in that battle had the enemy surrounded. There were a reported perhaps 8,000 enemy forces in there. Oh, they had the cream of the crop of Al-Qaeda caught. Journalist Seymour Hersh later broke this story in the New Yorker magazine, briefly sparking TV news coverage. And from there, all of a sudden, one night around Thanksgiving, in the middle of the siege, an air corridor was set up between Kanduz and northern Pakistan. And at night, Pakistani relief planes regularly flew through that corridor. It was a very orderly, organized thing that armed men would stand on the tarmac waiting for a flight that would come in, and then they would be taken out. For as many as four or 5,000, they were not only Al-Qaeda, but maybe even some of bin Laden's immediate family were flown out on those evacuations. It had to be done with the blessing of Musharraf, didn't exactly. it? Exactly, and of the United States. When I tell you it comes at the level of Don Rumsfeld, it has to. What we're describing here is something which would clearly be noticed by the United States. One or two, maybe not, okay? An airlift of these proportions, it certainly would. This is the most secure space on the face of the earth right now. If someone's moving over Afghanistan, the United States knows about it, clearly. No plane could fly from Kanduz to Pakistan without getting shot down unless we let it happen. And we let it happen, and I think there's just no other way to explain it. My take on it basically is the fact that there is some sort of a deal in place between the government of Pakistan and the United States. Intrigued, Thompson looked deeper into Pakistan. His timeline showed Osama bin Laden was reportedly last seen in Pakistan after escaping from Tora Bora. CBS News has exclusive information tonight. But thanks to an in-depth investigation by CBS, he, he also learned bin Laden was in Pakistan on the eve of 9-11. Bin Laden was spirited into this military hospital in Rawapendi for kidney dialysis treatment. The military had him surrounded, says this hospital employee who also wanted his identity masked. They were saying that Osama bin Laden had to be watched carefully and looked after. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. To better understand the ties between bin Laden and Pakistan, Thompson followed a timeline thread that began with covert Pakistan involvement in the Soviet-Afghan war two decades ago. In 1979, in the midst of the Cold War, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Throughout the 80s, the Soviets battled the Mujahideen, a group of anti-Soviet fighters that included bin Laden. The Mujahideen were backed by the Central Intelligence Agency, who hoped to give the Soviets their own costly Vietnam-type war. Rather than fund the Mujahideen directly, the CIA covertly channeled money through the Pakistani Intelligence Agency, the ISI. The Washington Post has published some of the definitive accounts of the conflicts. They helped create bin Laden uh, and, and the roots of al-Qaeda during the Russian occupation of Afghanistan uh, when the American CIA and the intelligence services of Pakistan and Saudi Arabia created this group of people to fight the Russians in Afghanistan. Billions of dollars from the CIA and the Saudis were passed through the ISI to support the war. The strategy worked, and the Soviets were defeated. The Taliban are widely alleged to be the creation of Pakistan's military intelligence, the ISI. Experts say that explains the Taliban's swift military successes. Emboldened by their victory and the influx of weapons and cash, the ISI helped to install the Taliban and deepen their ties to bin Laden and his terror network because there's really no difference between an ISI training camp for terrorism and an Al-Qaeda training camp for terrorism. You would have some people working for Al-Qaeda and they would go out to an Al-Qaeda mission 
And we had other people working for the ISI, and they would go off to Kashmir on one of their missions. Thompson wondered if ISI involvement in terrorism included the attacks of 9-11. Uh, uh, we will give the Pakistani government a chance to cooperate and to participate as we uh, hunt down uh, those people who committed this unbelievable, despicable act on America. What I am told by senior administration officials is the Pakistani government has promised to, quote, fully cooperate. The dictator of Pakistan, General Musharraf, Within days of the attacks, Pakistan was hailed as a major ally in the new war on terror. The White House seemed confident that al-Qaeda alone was behind 9-11. Will you release publicly a white paper which links him and his organization to this attack to we put are, people at ease? Yeah, we are hard at work uh, bringing all the information together, intelligence inf information, law enforcement information, and I think uh, in the near future we'll be able to put out a paper a uh, document that will describe quite clearly uh, the evidence that we have. No, I think that there was just a misinterpretation of the exact words the secretary used on the Sunday shows. I'm not aware of anybody who said white paper, and the secretary didn't say anything about a white paper yesterday. You know, you're, you're talking about actions in other parts of the world, um, and, and certainly you want the support of as many people around the world as possible. I, you know, I guess... It seems as though you're asking everyone to trust you. I mean, logic um, tells you they couldn't have done it alone. This was a sophisticated plot. Bin Laden was not capable of doing this by himself and his group. So who was capable? Obviously, there has to be much more of an investigation in Pakistan. But on October 1st, the FBI discovered evidence linking the alleged hijackers and al-Qaeda by following a money trail that ended at Mohammed Atta in Florida. Suspected hijacker Mohammed Atta received wire transfers via Pakistan and then distributed the cash via money orders bought here in Florida. A senior law enforcement source tells CNN the man sending the money to Atta is believed to be Ahmed Umar Saeed Sheikh. He reportedly is controlling certain aspects of the financial transactions of the Al-Qaeda network. Once a standout student at the London School of Economics, the British-born son of Pakistani parents speaks five languages. The story made news in every major newspaper. With 9-11 Paymaster identified as an alleged Al-Qaeda money man, it seemed that the U.S. finally had its proof that Al-Qaeda was involved the U.S. war on terror could now move ahead. But what most of his post-9-11 reports about Omar Saeed Sheikh had failed to mention was that at the same time, Sheikh dropped out of the London School of Economics to presumably join Al-Qaeda. He had also joined the ISI. Arresting officer A.K. Jane says, under questioning, Omar Sheikh admitted he was supported by the Pakistan government's intelligence service, the ISI. He had told me that. He admitted to you? Oh, yes, yes. And after his release, it was very clear that he was provided protection and safe haven in Pakistan with the direct uh, support, with the knowledge, and obviously with the connivance of the Pakistani intelligence. Only two days after the invasion of Afghanistan, the Times of India reported the FBI discovered credible evidence that $100,000 was wired to alleged hijacker Mohammed Atta by 9-11 paymaster Omar Saeed Sheikh on the orders of the ISI director, Lieutenant General Mahmoud Ahmed. Had that been the head of the Iraqi intelligence agency, do you think we would have heard of it? You have to understand that uh, Lieutenant General Mahmoud Ahmed was a key player. William Pepper is an international lawyer and consultant to the Pakistani government. Indian state intelligence came upon this transfer. It was then that the Times of India was able to get this information, and the FBI got involved in this whole situation because this was now becoming very public as a result of the Indian investigation. 
Though the evidence was never publicly disclosed, Indian intelligence claimed that the FBI had privately confirmed the story to them, and it soon made every major Indian newspaper. In the U.S., only a single news outlet even mentioned the allegation. The information was reported as an Internet-only story on the editorial section of the Wall Street Journal website. It had this cutesy title, but it contained this completely explosive information. After the Times of India story broke, Paymaster Omar Saeed Sheikh was no longer the apparent proof that al-Qaeda was the sole sponsor of the attacks. Instead, Saeed Sheikh, acting on the orders of the ISI, appeared to be the smoking gun of Pakistani involvement in 9-11. And instantly, within uh, that day, basically, Saeed Sheikh becomes persona non grata. And then a whole bunch of other people are put forth as the paymaster of over the next several months, authorities began confusing the news media with a bewildering variety of alternate names for the paymaster, each sounding similar to Omar Saeed Sheikh. No, it's this guy. No, it's this guy. They keep changing the story about who the guy is, and it becomes hard to keep track. By the one-year anniversary of 9-11, Newsweek had concluded that the paymaster remains almost a total mystery. The 9-11 Commission would ultimately conclude that the question of who financed the attacks is of little practical significance. And in my opinion, it seems to be a bunch of smoke and mirrors to try to really hide the fact that there's money coming from the ISI going to the hijackers. If we were really going after the people who sponsored al-Qaeda, wouldn't we be bombing Pakistan? Are we better off in Pakistan or in Iraq in terms of beating terrorism? I would say to you, if you'd ask me that question, I would say, no question. Let's forget about Iraq and let's focus on Pakistan. There is no reason for the administration to continue to shield make-believe allies who are supporting either directly or indirectly terrorists whose goal is to kill America. And do you think that will ever become public? Which countries are uh, talking about? It'll become about? public at some point when it's turned over to the archives, but uh, that's 20 or 30 years from now. We need to have this information now because it's relevant to the threat that the people of the United States are facing today. And here the story took another unexpected turn. Several top news sources had all reported that the Pakistani ISI director had actually been in Washington for a rare visit during the week of September 11th. Yes. Are, you, uh, are you aware of the reports at the time that ISI chief was in Washington on September 11th and on September 10th, $100,000 was wired from Pakistan to these groups here in this area. And uh, why he was here, was meeting with you or anybody in the administration? Um, I have not seen that report and he was certainly not meeting with me. Yes? LA Weekly reported that on the very evening of September 11th, U.S. State Department officials began negotiating the terms of the U.S.-Pakistani partnership with ISI Director Mahmoud Ahmed the very man who was alleged to have ordered the wire transfer to Mohammed Atta. The talks continued over the next several days before the Lieutenant General returned to Pakistan on September 14th. But an undercover operative named Randy Glass says he can prove that USA officials knew about the ISI role in 9-11 even as they chose to partner with Pakistan. The revelation came in yet another largely overlooked story, this one reported by Dateline NBC. Con man turned undercover operative Randy Glass was infiltrating a terrorist arms buying network layer by layer. Former con man Glass was part of a 1999 government sting called Operation Diamondback, a two and a half year investigation by the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. On July 22, 1999, Glass flew to New York for a meeting here at the Trendy Tribeca Grill. It was dinner for four. Glass, his first contact, Dia Moishan, the Jersey City businessman, Mike Malik, and the mystery man, R.G. Abbas. You know who supplies the most money? Who? Yeah. Glass was wearing a wire. Mixed in with the dinner crowd were agents from the FBI's terrorism task force. 
basically what he told me was they were interested in purchasing a large amount of sophisticated weapon systems. And who was Abbas representing in this? Abbas was represented to me as being an ISI agent. And this is where the stakes really get high, because if Abbas was telling the truth, Randy Glass and the feds were about to cut an illegal weapons deal with a Pakistani intelligence operative linked to terrorists. The story of Randy Glass never seemed to quite catch on. If you ask most people, have you heard about this? Have you heard about Randy Glass? They haven't heard about it. Earlier today... Perhaps the story failed to spark the public imagination because the most dramatic revelation ended up on Dateline's cutting room floor. I had been threatened by FBI agent Steve Berdowski that if I mentioned any of that, I would be charged with obstruction of justice. Two months later, the Palm Beach Post ran this story. During the course of the conversation, I asked him exactly what his intentions were. After dinner, as we walked outside, he pointed in the direction of the World Trade Center and said, those towers are coming down. I'm not suggesting from this that Pakistan is the quote-unquote solution to 9-11, because it's not. Pakistan is one part in a very complicated story. But the question to me is, who else was involved with Al-Qaeda? Was Al-Qaeda used as a tool? Just as in the 1980s, the Mujahideen were basically used by the U.S. government In August 2004, after the 9-11 Commission had disappointed so many of the families with its report, Paul Thompson's completed timeline was published as a book by HarperCollins. The recurring themes of Paul Thompson's timeline are clear. No accountability, few answers, and many missed leads. The sponsors of the attack yet to be confronted. Is the fact that there is some sort of a deal in place between the government of Pakistan and the United States. The men named as the culprits allowed to escape. But we haven't really captured anybody, one or two on the fringe. And the government officials who ignored warnings before 9-11 still in their positions. I don't remember the Al-Qaeda cells as being something that we were told we needed to do something about. Isn't it? Still, despite years of investigation and advocacy by the families and others, the official story of what really happened on September 11th remains little changed. What is democracy? You know, it's government by the people. It's a simple equation, okay? The biggest part of democracy is the media. They have to hold everyone accountable. You know, it would be impossible as a citizen to be up and informed on every single topic because it took us thousands of hours of research in order to be informed enough to ask the right questions here. And that's where you need media because you know what? Somebody has to be out there connecting the dots. And we don't have that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Diane and Charlie. Please don't go away because... I think news reporting has drastically changed since 9-11. Rebecca Abrams, an assignment editor with ABC News. The reporting now, there is always use of caution in how we cover a story. For those tuning to the internet rather than network news, online buzz about President Bush in the Florida classroom had started within weeks of the attacks. But most Americans remained unaware. For nearly three years, the footage gathered dust on newsroom shelves as the networks avoided the issue in their anniversary retrospectives. ABC News is going to be with you all day long, bringing you the events of the day, starting with the memorial here. They seem to go out of their way to avoid exposing the president's lack of response. Has the president thought for a 
second or two about getting up and walking out of the room, but the drill was coming to a close and he didn't want to alarm the children. Instead, Bush pauses, thanks the children. Thank you also very much for showing me your reading skills. And heads for the empty classroom next door. This is Michael Moore. Finally, into the void created by the news media glossing over the discomforting issues came filmmaker Michael Moore with his record-breaking film, Fahrenheit 9-11. Sharply critical of the administration, the film sparked controversy and fiery attacks on Moore himself, including during prime time at the Republican National Please. Convention. Please, my friends. He's certainly not a disingenuous filmmaker. Why had it been left to McCain's disingenuous filmmaker to bring these questions to the American public? At Fahrenheit 911, which is based a lot on our reports at BBC television on my book, ABC News has free access to everything we do at BBC television. We say, go ahead, run it. Run the story. You don't like the way Michael Moore does it? You think it's too polemical or biased? Fine. Run the hard news, buddy. It's on AP, it's uh, We are every day kicking and screaming in the newsroom, um, trying to get stories out. But we could do a story and it might not make air. You have someone from the corporation making the editorial decisions. These are not journalists. Another reaction from the administration now, and again, not exactly... With the stifling of dissent on the rise in America after 9-11, the tough questions were not asked, much less answered. You know, there was a time in South Africa that people would put flaming tires around people's necks uh, if they dissented. And in some ways, the fear is that you, you'll be necklaced here. You'll have a flaming tire of lack of patriotism put around your neck. Now, it's that fear that keeps journalists from asking the toughest of the tough questions. So all this information keeps popping out here and there, but what happens is that no one wants to take the ball and run with it because all the information's there. If we could put it together and get it into the Washington Post as a, 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 a 10 day series, and people are saying, unbelievable. The facts were dribbled out and over such an extended period of time that I think that effect was lost on the American public. The press should have been doing a better job of putting those uh, conflicts, if you will, you know, side by side in a cumulative report. But that's not the job of reporting. That's the job of editorial pages and politicians and others to make those kinds of judgments, and the public itself, and the 9-11 relatives themselves, to make those kinds of assertions. All we can do in our reporting is report facts. And we have reported those facts, and we have held those facts up against public statements at the time, which is why they know that that's, that's what took place from our reporting. This is a scandal of tremendous proportions. It makes Watergate look small. But there's a strange lack of interest of people both on the left and on the right. Nobody seems to want to uncover the truth and just follow leads wherever they may go. Because I think that goes to a lot of really damaging places. Maybe we shouldn't have questioned whether or not President Nixon had any involvement in Watergate. Maybe we should have just accepted that story. Maybe we should have accepted the story that President Clinton had no involvement, had never had sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. So just because it's the official story of record does not mean that we should not delve further and to see if really that is the actual story. Yes, they lied, they all lied, whether consciously or unconsciously, it happened. Now we need to look into why they lied and what were the results of those wars? We can't have these wars reorganize our way of life based on a false understanding of what 9-11 was. We have to go beyond the myth and get to the truth. We have to know.
We have to. 9-11 was the biggest don't ask, don't tell. And if it wasn't for the families, we wouldn't have anything. And that's very frightening. We had to take this tragedy um, and do the best we could with our lives and with our country um, to try and make <sighs> the people that are supposed to protect us do the right thing. What I really wanted to happen here is for my children to feel safe. I could have cared less who was in office. I wanted the truth and I wanted what was wrong to be fixed. What we're left with after our journey is no answers, no accountability, and I've wasted four years of my life trying my damnedest, along with the other family members, to make sure this never happens again. Let me just say something real quickly about my son, Keith. On the wall in his room, he, it said, knowledge is power. I am only doing this for one reason and one reason only, to carry on his legacy. I'm so pissed off at the American people. I'm so pissed off at this government because of this cover-up. John Gerard Coughlin, Timothy J. Coughlin, Anne Marie Kramer, Christopher Seaton Kramer, and my big brother, Wade Brian Green. We miss you, we love you, and you are always in our hearts. For this week's training, the Dow lost more than 351 points, that's 3% of its overall value. NASDAQ was off almost 93, that's more than a 4% drop for the week. We'll take a break here.